uh, this evening, the Macon Forum, we're pleased to welcome Father Augustine Thompson, the Order of Preachers. He entered the order in 1977 and was ordained a priest in 1985. He has many degrees from religious and uh, both religious and secular degrees. And he has uh, one of the, he he's, uh, has two things that make him among the ancient, a uh, place him among the ancient Dominicans. And that he's actually taught in a secular university, like we once used to do. And that he has not, I mean, I have a master's in arts and theology, but he has a true master of art, a master of, a, of, a master of sacred theology from the order of preachers itself, as Albert the Great had, or Thomas Aquinas had. It's an order, it's, a, it's an honor we bestow upon our members who have been uh, contributors among the teachers and writers of our order. And Father Augustine has written about what is it, six books on, on Reformation and medieval history, as well as republishing or re-editing or even uh, putting together, compiling some books that have to do with the Dominican liturgy, particularly for our order. And he's been a proponent uh, for the Dominican liturgy during his time in the order. And, and his part, even though he's never been assigned here to Holy Rosary, was a big part of that uh, a movement that's really gaining ground in the church to, to that the liturgies of the church might enrich one another. And so we welcome Father Augustine, who this evening give a, a uh, his, his outline on uh, the life of St. Francis of Assisi, according to his, his research. And I'd like to welcome him, Father Augustine. St. Francis, in his two-sentence long letter to St. Anthony of Padua, said, I approve of you teaching theology to the brothers so long as it does not reduce prayer and devotion. And so let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Saint Our Lady, Queen of the Holy Rosary, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I have given versions of this talk a number of times as my own work on Francis has developed. Uh, the project I'll say something about in a little bit, uh, it, ha it will come out from Cornell University Press in May. Uh, the title is, easy to remember, Francis of Assisi, A New Life. And since I have lots of competition in Lives of St. Francis, I'd first like to find out which ones people here have read. Uh, when I first thought of doing this project, it went through my mind, gee, do we really need another biography of Francis? How many of them are there? So I went to the internet to something called WorldCat, which is a library catalog for almost every American library and a number in Europe. And for the period from, what was it, from the period 1995 to 2005 when I started the project, I put in Francis of Assisi biography and a number of titles came out as published over that 20 year period and it was approximately 20 biographies a year. So uh, what I've discovered though, it's interesting, especially in Catholic groups, uh, the ones that people know seem to almost always fall into certain categories. Certain ones come up all the time. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to put you on the uh, hot seat by asking you which one yet. But how many people here have read a biography of Francis? Higher. All right. How many have never read a biography of Francis? 
My goodness, there are more non-Francis biography readers. Uh, the, let's see the hands of those who have read a biography again. And keep them up if you're willing to tell me which one or ones you've read. Yeah. Uh, what do you, yeah. Every time I've given a lecture to Catholic groups, G.K. Chesterton's biography, which is probably a little more Chesterton than Francis, always comes up. Great literary masterpiece. Who? Oh, yes, uh, which is a fictionalized version. Yeah, it's sort of yeah, it, but it's uh, it's lots of fun. It's a beautiful read. Who who has read another any other one? Yes, in the back. Which? Oh, the little flowers, which is really not modern. It's from the 14th century. Probably the most co commonly read book in the Middle Ages in Italy. The first great masterpiece, aside from poetry like Dante, of stories. And I'll say something about that in a little while. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, the big red, fat red book uh, that for a long time was if you didn't read Latin and Italian, that was the place to go. It's now been replaced. And those of you who have the sheets, uh, the Franciscans of the Midwest province, the very same group that published the omnibus of Franciscan sources, which was a 1,400-page fat red thing, it's now expanded to three volumes in much more readable translations, taking advantage of the very important discoveries of the last 40 years. But very important collection of texts, so you'll know the things I'm going to say something about here, which is where we find out about Francis himself. Yes? Oh, gee, that could be so, so many. Uh, it may have been a reprint of Father Cuthbert or Jorgensen. No. Hand over here. Yes, of the of the Midwestern Franciscans. One w that was written especially for use in third order groups uh, of the Franciscan third order. It's a devotional. It's a devotional work. Uh, let's try a few. No one has read Jorgensen. Ah, okay. That was a classic at the turn of the of the of the 1900s. Early ni written in 1909 uh, by a, conver a Norwegian convert. My family's Norwegian. I always put in a plug for the Norwegians. We have the most revolting ethnic cuisine in the world. Uh, how about uh, how about I had mentioned earlier also Father Cuthbert of Brighton's. Ah, that was probably up till the 1940s. That was among Catholics the most commonly read. Uh, lots of competition, though, from G.K. Chesterton. Uh, anyone read Omer Engelbert? Oh, that's too bad. I think that's the best, the best one until mine. <laughs> Let's do some of the ones that are interesting. Has anyone read Spoto's biography, The Reluctant Saint? Ah, so there the hand goes up. That was given to you, Father, by your... High school principal? No, no, it was the minister general or the minister provincial of the San Francisco province. What's his name? I, I, Vitaly. Yeah, Vitaly, yeah. Uh, he said that I would know if I wanted to be a Franciscan or not after I read it. <laughs> and you notice it didn't work. Uh, it's actually, uh, I, my experience with Spoda was I said, I can't believe that this man is f most famous for writing biographies of Hollywood stars. His m biggest seller was his life of Marilyn Monroe. On the other hand, reading it, there was nothing really new in it, but I, one thing I will say about he's very perceptive about Francis's psychology. How about uh, anyone read Adrian Hastings, the reporter for the Times of London? That was a big seller. Well, I began to worry when I noticed that there were um, approximately 20 biographies coming out every year when I first started to think about this project. And so I printed out the names and titles, and I quickly realized that I was not in trouble. Of the, so, say, 20 new titles that come out a year, probably, oh, probably of them well over a third, close to half, are devotional books. 
uh, they often have names like St. Francis and the Donkey. They're written for children. They're written for ed- edification. They're, there's no new discoveries on Francis. It's a, it's a standard set of stories popularized and rewritten. Then there's another third or more. And these are ones where Francis is, it's not about Francis, it's about something Francis can represent. Here you find Francis the ecologist, Francis the Marxist, that's a very popular one. He was against capitalism. Francis the feminist, Francis the nature mystic, Francis the pantheist, Francis into ecumenical dialogue with Muslims. It goes on and on, and what it is, it's the story of Francis we've all heard at least once or twice in some form, but him as the patron of some project of the author. And then there's this little group of things by historians, mostly Franciscans, who have spent their lives working on the material we have to learn about Francis. They had me worried. I started reading them, and I realized I had nothing to worry about. I'll explain why in a little while, but the general consensus among the academics, the scholars, including the Franciscans who work on Francis, their conclusion is we can know nothing about Francis. All we can know is what people thought about him. I, by the way, disagree with that position, and I'll say something about that in a little bit. But it might be worthwhile for me to come clean and explain why, as a Dominican, I actually started this project and wrote the book. Uh, Five years ago, I was professor of religious studies and history at the University of Virginia. I had been there seven years. Before that, I taught at the University of Oregon. And when you're in an institution that prides itself on research and scholarship, faculty members about every six years get a sabbatical. Now, some people think a sabbatical must be something like a vacation that lasts a year. It's not quite like that. What happens is when you come back at the end of the sabbatical, the dean will say to you, what did you write on your year of academic sabbatical? And you darn well better have something to tell him about and show him, or her, or you don't get another sabbatical ever again. Uh, The sabbatical before that had been the culmination of a long period of work in which I had written a book on the religious life of lay people in in Italy in the time of Francis, Dominic, uh, and Bonaventure, and Dante uh, called Cities of God. And when I had written it, a number of people had been suggesting to me that I should write a second volume, which would be, go. I went up to the year 1325, trace what religious life was like for ordinary lay people in Italy, which is what I work on, up to the time of the Renaissance. Well, the amount of source material for that is gigantic. Cities of God took me 10 years of research and writing. It was a lot of work. And I thought, I can take the sabbatical and I can start to work on that project, but I need cover. Because when I am done, I will not have a book. I probably won't even have an article because I'll be starting such a big project. And then I said, I know what I will do. A hundred years of scholarship has gone into studying the sources for Francis of Assisi. In the evenings, I will write a biography of Francis. And then when I come back and the dean says to me, Professor Thompson, what did you write? I'd show him the manuscript and see, I wrote a biography of Francis. And he'll really like that because he'll have heard of him. (laughs) Well, Uh, I began the year by uh, a little over a a month, almost two months, at St. Bonaventure's University in upstate New York, which is the place which is the home of the Franciscan Historical Institute. Michael Cusato is its director, someone I had known for years. And that was a good place. And as I began to work on my own project and then start to read the literature on Francis for my evening work, I realized that the Francis Project was becoming far more exciting and alive for me. That was the project that I really got excited about. Looking at the Renaissance stuff, I, I, it was boring me. But Francis was different. And I have to be honest, I was never much devoted to Francis. We Dominicans call him Holy Father Francis, and he's our, one of our inspirations, and I don't pray to him. Uh, he was not high on my list of saints. 
I didn't think badly of him. He was just not a saint that I was ever interested in. And part of that, I think, was the way in which I'd usually encountered Francis, which is the Francis we almost always hear about. Now, how many people have seen a movie about Francis? Let me guess, brother, son, sister, moon. God, what a bad movie. For a historian, that movie causes, I'd rather have root canal. And I'm allergic to Novocaine. Okay, so I should say, I'd rather have another root canal without Novocaine. Uh, but I love especially the lepers because they're so beautiful. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's typical Zeffirelli. It's a very beautiful movie. But the image of Francis is he's dopey. I mean, he crawls around petting rocks. <laughs> the other version of it is Francis is betrayed by his own followers. That's the other usual story. Francis got a message from God. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He goes to the Pope and gets it approved. And... What happens? He is betrayed, first in his lifetime, and then several times afterwards. He is so perfect that even Jesus has flaws compared to Francis. Francis' only problem is his followers, who don't appreciate how wonderful he is. This is not like any religious, even the holy ones that I've ever met. I found this a very off-putting image. Francis the Perfect, betrayed by his followers. By the way, that story was invented in the early 1300s, and its most famous example, although toned down a bit, is the Little Flowers of St. Francis of Assisi, which I was praising before. The Francis of that is very much misunderstood, and people are betraying him and his vision of poverty. The date, 1337. Francis died in 1226. These are also on the handout. That's, uh, I'm not very good at math at the board. What's that, 100, 111 years between his death and the writing of that? Uh, the other thing is that the, the, doc, the original story that the Little Flowers is a translation of into Italian from Latin was written by rebel Franciscans living in the woods who had been excommunicated by the Pope. They're the ones who were the first ones to identify the Pope as the Antichrist. So it might not be surprising that the Francis of the Little Flowers is exploited, misunderstood, and in conflict with make horrible hissing sounds, the institutional church. Uh, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon is a classical example of this. Do you remember the scene, those who have seen the movie, when Francis uh, takes all his clothes off? And you remember the bishop, big fat guy, is Bishop Guido, who's having lunch, comes out and says, you're inter interrupting our prayers. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, bishop Guido is a real person. Bishop Guido was a church reformer. He was Francis' advisor from his first time of his conversion. He was a known ascetic. He is nothing like the movie. But, of course, you have to have Francis at war with fat bishops, right? <laughs> The more problems with that movie, but we can leave that aside. And so what I'm going to do this evening is I'm not going to tell you the biography of Francis. Uh, and the reason is I want to tell you two stories about my odyssey of discovery and finding Francis and what it was like. Each one of them will show a different perspective, a different view on the typical issue of image of Francis the way he's usually portrayed. Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, or any of the biographies we've seen. They'll also have some interesting sleuthing along the way. And then I'm going to stop so that we can bring up anything about Francis that you'd like me to talk about, ask me questions. Uh, often people want to hear about Francis in nature. There's often questions about Claire. Aspects of Francis you'd be interested in, I can talk forever on it. But before we do that, to show how this works, uh, is there anyone here who did a Ph.D. in history? Uh, I did. I did mine at Berkeley, the buckle of the atheist belt. Uh, are you a historian? Oh, not in history. Not in history. Okay. Uh, anybody do a master? Uh, do a ma do a major in history as a as a as a college student? Couple. Uh, okay. The people who did that. Uh, what's your favorite light reading? People who did. 
I, I want to see if this works, because among professional historians, we always have the same light reading. Given Tacitus. Uh, that's pretty heavy duty reading. <laughs> light reading. <laughs> Barbara Tuckman is popular history. I'm talking not, not business, not history. What do you read in paperback on planes? <laughs> yeah. O'Brien. Yes, historical fiction is very popular. Oh, this is which, which O'Brien? Uh, Michael O'Brien, uh, yeah, the the apocalyptic ones, not the guy who's got the naval novels. No, that's my Patrick. That's the O'Brien I like. Uh, I taught, by the way, um, Brother Elias, Father Elias, oh, Father Elijah. I've taught it in apocalyptic classes, classes on apocalyptic as well. Historians, we all read detective fiction. Everybody, and you sit down at a conference, and when they talk about what do they watch on television? Can you guess what it is? No, crime scene investigation. <laughs> so what I'm, first we need to get the evidence out and know, know the evidence for Francis. Francis of Assisi, he came from a quite wealthy mercantile family. His father was in the cloth business in a little town in central Italy, up in the mountains, in the valley of Spoleto, Assisi. He was born in 1180, 1181. We're not sure exactly which year, but he was baptized in 1181 at Easter. That we do know. He then died in 1226. He, we have writings by him. We have a lot of writings by him, comparatively. Uh, in the three-volume replacement, which is uh, for the omnibus, the big red volume that was mentioned by the gentleman back there, 180 pages of it is his own writing. That's a lot. For a man who was, he knew enough Latin and he had enough penmanship to scribble some things occasionally. He had to do bookkeeping. They did it in Latin in the business he was involved in. We have two pieces of parchment with his own handwriting on them. One written before he has the miraculous stigmata, and one afterwards, and I'll tell you, his penmanship went downhill like crazy. <laughs> Obviously, Francis's own writings have to play a central position in finding out what Francis was about. The amazing thing is, most of the biographies of Francis, they are of extremely secondary importance which should be a shocking thing. Part of it, I think, is that some of his own writings don't fit what people think Francis is supposed to be about. He wrote eight letters. They're fairly short. And what is Francis famous for, other than talking to animals? Oh, oh we'll get back to the Peace Prayer of St. Francis. Poverty. All right, I better do it. This is the one that makes my, has made students angry at me many times. There are two things that make people angry at me. The first is when I say that um, the Wolf of Gubbio story is probably a fiction. That gets some people up. But the one that really gets people upset is when I let them know Peace Prayer of St. Francis was not written by St. Francis. Yeah, I hear, hear all the people. Does anyone know who actually wrote it? It, it first appears, it's in French, in a French military journal, the journal of the French uh, what, chaplain corps called La Clochette, the little bell, and it's anonymous. And it came out in 1914, just before World War I. <laughs> now, even better, when did it first appear, and it says nothing about Francis. Next, when did it come into English? 1924, the first time it appears in English, it's on the back of a priest's ordination card. And it's in English, and it says, Francis of Assisi on it. The priest was a priest of the Diocese of Boston. His name was Francis Spellman. <laughs> Cardinal Spellman, yes. I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> that and... Now comes, the, but, and this one, I remember the looks of horror of some undergraduates when I'd say, who's read anything by Francis? And it was always, they knew the peace prayer of Francis. Horrible look, well, and I can tell you, not only was it not written by Francis, Francis could never have written it. 
What's the most common word in the peace pair of St. Francis? Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is war, let me do such and such. Let me, 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 me. I, 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 I. In all of Francis's authentic writings and all his prayers, he never, call, he never uses the first person pronoun. Isn't that interesting? The prayer is very, which is a beautiful prayer, by the way. I have nothing against it, but it's very egocentric. It's all about what I can do and make me do this and so forth. Francis's writing is always God-centric. Through nature sometimes, but even nature is in relation to God. So, it would be very helpful. Oh, and I'll tell you. You would think it would be poverty. Maybe it would be nature. What? He wrote eight letters. One of them is a very long one. The others are short. He is very upset. Very upset. It, the letters crackle. They're no longer than a page each. Do you know what he's upset about? Dirty purificators and unpolished chalices. <laughs> Francis the sacristy rat. You can see why people might not pay attention to his own writings. But they are the first thing we should pay attention to. The first life of St. Francis was written by... Thomas of Chalano. He was a Franciscan. He knew Francis. He was commissioned to write it for Francis's canonization. He completed it two years after Francis's death in 1228. In it, he knows virtually nothing about Francis's youth. He seems to have never discussed it with Francis. And the descriptions of his youth sound like things he's borrowing from other saints' lives. After Francis retired from his leadership of the order when he was very sick, which he does in 1223, for the last, what would that be? Uh, the last three years of his life, he lives as a hermit. Chilano knows nothing about that period. But for the middle period, he's very good. Also, he doesn't seem to have many axes to grind. He'd have a hard time getting away with it two years after Francis's death, if he's going to fake it. Believe it or not, this life, which I consider very important, especially for that part of Francis's life, has been disliked for a hundred years by historians, and it's especially unpopular with Franciscans. Why? Because the Francis of this life is not at war with the institutional church. The argument is that it's been faked to make him look like a good Catholic. <laughs> I'm not joking. The next oldest life, which was actually only discovered 60 years ago in a manuscript in Perugia, which is a little town down the road from Assisi. Actually, it's a pretty big town down the road from Assisi. And it was known as anonymous because no one knew who wrote it. All these years of scholarship have not been in vain. We now, although we still call it anonymous of Perugia, we know who wrote it, John of Perugia. And we also know within six months when it was written. A hundred years of intense scholarship has done wonderful things. We have been able to date, identify, find stuff on Francis that didn't exist 50 years ago, a hundred years ago. It is extremely good, probably eyewitness, for the period from Francis's conversion up till the order has about three or four hundred members, which is around 19, uh, 1215. So from 1209 to 1215, it's, I, it's wonderful. It's my favorite of all the sources. The stories in it, you can hear. I, I feel like I'm sitting there with people who were really there. And it's, not, it's only partially about Francis. Its real name, it's on the thing there, is much longer. And it's about Francis and his original followers. That's why it's nice that the original followers seem to be the ones writing it. The Legend of the Three Companions. Back in the 19th century, the search for Francis. Uh, how, has anyone here read the, uh, the major legend or great legend of Bonaventure? Almost every biography of Francis up to this time is organized and structured following the way in which uh, Bonaventure in 1260, wrote what would become the official biography of Francis for Franciscans. In 1893, a French liberal Protestant named Sabatier had found a document called, which was titled The Very Old Legend of St. Francis of Assisi. 
the Legenda Antiquissima Sancti Franceschi. And it had at the front that it was written in 1266. 1226. If that was true, it would be very old. It would be older than Chilano. Not only that, this document presented Francis as a radical, misunderstood by the church, persecuted by the hierarchy, on and on, the Francis that you find in Brother Sun, Sister Moon. And he wrote a biography of Francis in that spirit from this ancient, ancient document. This caused an explosion, an explosion of anger from Franciscans who wanted to defend Francis as an Orthodox Catholic. Twenty years of scholarly debate, it was prob finally demonstrated beyond a question of a doubt that the date of this thing that Sabatier had found was actually 1328. He didn't rewrite his biography. He went off and found other things that he thought would give the same story. One of the places he thought he could get the same story was the so-called legend of the three companions. Frankly, I don't see how he can see that because most of it is reprocessed stuff. This legend is a literary forgery. It starts with a letter that's not a forgery from three Franciscans, Leo, Angelo, and Rufino. And they say to the head of the Franciscan order, Crescentius of Jesse, we who were friends of Francis, who knew him, have collected up stories. We have not tried to put them in any order, and we're passing them on as you have requested to the whole order from those who knew Francis. What we see, however, is not a collection of stories. It's a carefully crafted, beautifully written biography. Somebody has and the question is, what's in it and where did it come from? Were they the stories from this group, these three followers of Francis? I'll say more about that in a minute. Somebody reworked it. The importance of this text, however, is not the later stories in Francis's life. Whoever crafted the story knew the city of Assisi and Francis's family very well. The Legend of the Three Companions is the best source for Francis before his religious conversion. And after that, you can use it, but it's not probably the best. Chilano II. After these sort of things have been written and all these new stories were collected, Thomas of Chilano was asked to write a second biography to replace his first one, to take into consideration this huge mass of material. The new biography called the Memoir of, a, of the Desire of a Soul, we call it Chilano II, or The Second Life of Francis, is a huge, sprawling, badly organized, unreadable horror story. Uh, you, it's really, it's all over the place. However, it's got all this new stuff in it that appears to have been collected. Needless to say, it was a failure. No Franciscan wanted to read it. That's why eventually Bonaventure would be, a, would be asked to write a new biography to replace Chilano II. Chilano II, nobody liked it. Today, there are only th three and a half known manuscripts of it. Compare that to the hundreds of manuscripts of Bonaventure, actually near a thousand, or to Chilano I, of which there are 25 manuscripts. Well, Anonymous of Perugia, there are only two manuscripts, and The Legends of the Three Companions are only five. But nobody really wanted Chilano II, but it's important because it's got a witness to all the stuff that's been collected. Jump to the Assisi compilation. The Assisi compilation is a manuscript from 1310. It contains a jumble of stories. It sounds like the kind of document that those three friars, the three companions wrote. They said, we collected a bunch of stories in no order. The problem with it is that it, some of its stories are taken right out of Chilano, some are out of the legend of the three companions. Uh, so it's obviously, in the form we have it, not a dossier of documents. Does anyone here follow historical Jesus scholarship? Can you tell us what the Q document is? Yes. Uh, usual biblical critics. I, I'm a regular historian. I always find biblical criticism slightly amusing. It's almost like a parody of real scholarship. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, 
The consensus opinion is Mark is the oldest gospel and that Matthew and Luke could have used Mark, but Matthew and, Lu- Matthew and Luke have things in common. They must have gotten it from some other source. That's Quella in German. We don't speak German, so we just call it Q. Do you know that people spend their lives studying Q? Notice it's a hypothetical document. No one's ever seen it. Okay, the great joy of Francis, Francis scholarship has one of these too. Uh, collection of stories, maybe collection of stories. Hey, there are stories. There must be the legend of Perugia. All these stories that were brought together for Crescentius of Jesse at the per- per- Perugia chapter. Do you know how many manuscripts there are of the legend of Perugia? Take a guess. Zero. It's been edited three times. I don't believe in it. I only, I'm a historian. I only work with real documents, not imaginary ones. Okay, why have I done this? It's because for a hundred years since Sabatier, pe- enormous effort has gone into making sense of all these sources and trying to reconstruct the Francis who was the man in the 13th century. Uh, I want to make a little caveat before I now do my two detective stories for you. I think legends are wonderful. My colleague, Father Michael Morris, at the Dominican Seminary in Oakland, does religion in the arts, and he's always saying to me, you're trying to destroy the legends about Francis. And I say, no, I'm not. I think they're wonderful, and often the legends, the things that were borrowed from other saints' lives or made up later, often tell us wonderful truths about Francis, but they're just not historical sources. They're fiction, but they're true fiction. In a sense, they make commentary. So the goal was first to figure out what's the stuff that's really commentary. A modern modern biographer will give you his own opinions on stuff. Medieval biographers didn't do it that way. They made up a story that would fit to explain what they were trying to say. Or they borrow something from another saint's life. Now, do you know, studies have been done not only to date these things. We now know down to three decimal places because of computerized studies. The percentage of Chilano 1 used by Anonymous of Perugia, we know down to three decimal places. The percentage of Chalana 1 and Anonymous of Perugia used by the legend of the Three Companions. We know down to three decimal points. The percentage of Chalano, Anonymous, legend in Chalano 2. The sources are known backwards, forwards, inside out, upside down. And if you are a scholar on Francis, you're not a scholar on Francis. You are the scholar on a document. One of the great San Franciscan scholars, I love that term, as opposed to Franciscan scholars who study Franciscan, San Franciscan scholars study San Francis. Uh, Moncelli, he spent, who's a great, and the man who most inspired me, he spent most of his life studying 25 stories from the Assisi compilation, all of which were signed, we who were with him saw this. They're usually referred to by pedants as the nos qui cum eo fuimus documents. They, historians like to quote stuff in Latin. It makes everyone else feel dumb. <laughs> or take uh, Delarune, great French French scholar. He has spent his entire life studying Francis's two-page deathbed conversion, uh, a deathbed uh, will and testament. Uh, Debonet, he has spent his entire life. He is the world's expert on. The first rule of, well, the first, the 1221 rule of Francis, it's nine pages long. And they have reached the conclusion they can only know the documents, they can't know Francis. Now I will show you that Dominicans can find Francis where Franciscans fail. (laughs) There is, in the study of the early Franciscans, there is a horrible, horrible problem It is called the tonsure of Brother Giles. When Francis and his first followers went to Rome, I'll tell you the story. Let me tell you what this is about. It is known that Francis and his followers had the top of their hair cut off. 
Uh, that's called the tonsure, and it made you a member of the clergy, even though you weren't ordained. It made you a cleric. Uh, this meant you could, were tried by church courts. You couldn't be hanged. There were a bunch of things about, and you, you were a pers- you were the church. You were an ecclesiastical person. Today, this kind of status starts with the diaconate, but in those days, it started with the tonsure. And Bonaventure had met Giles. Giles was 80 years old when Bonaventure met him, and Bonaventure knew something, which a lot of people knew. Bonaventure knew that Giles was a lay brother. You can't be simultaneously a cleric and a lay person. They're mutually exclusive. You can't, it's like you can't be sort of a priest or sort of pregnant. You're just one or the other. There is no option. Well, in Chilano 1, here is, the story goes something like this. Here is the story of Chilano 1. Francis has come back from his military service and gone through a very bad period. Although I only say it in my commentary in the back, not in the biography, I think he probably was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. He'd been in a battle where over half the people in, in the Assisi army had been killed or captured and were imprisoned in Perugia. He spent a year in a stinking prison in Perugia. Finally brought back by his parents, ransomed back. He's living out in the woods, and he goes to church at San Damiano. And he hears the gospel sung at Mass. And we're told what the gospel was. Give up all things and follow me. Take neither traveling bag nor staff nor money in your purse and wear sandals. Take up your cross daily. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful gospel? Has anyone noticed something wrong with it? Yeah? They're not the same gospel. They come from three different gospels. Yeah, very good. You're a homeschooler, right? (laughs) Okay, and uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. This should be bothering us. So Francis then says, after the priest has explained this to him, he says, yes, that's what I want to do. And he makes himself a Franciscan habit, and he starts to collect followers. His first followers is Bernard of Quintavalle, who was his old party buddy from his pre-conversion days. Then comes Peter. They used to think this was Peter of Catani, but it's probably not. It's probably some Peter no one ever heard of. Then comes Brother Giles. Finally, he gets 12 followers. Does this sound like an interesting story? Who else had 12 followers? Are we feeling nervous? And he says, now that, we have tw- now that there are 12 of us, we'll go to Rome and we'll get the Pope to approve our order. They go to Rome. The Pope approves it. You know the, uh, you know the stories of the dream of... You've even seen pictures, I'm sure, of Francis holding up the, the Lateran Basilica. Before they leave, all 12 of them are tonsured. Uh, was Giles in that group? Yes. See, I asked questions like that of my students to make sure they were listening. Okay, they were all tonsured. Was Giles tonsured? Yes, it does sound that way, doesn't it? Now, Bonaventure meets Giles when he's 80 years old and knows he's a lay brother. How can you be a lay brother and get tonsured? Bonaventure was a brilliant man. His solution is beautiful. Giles got a small tonsure. I'm not making this up. A corona parvula, that's what he called it. There's a problem. Before Bonaventure discovered that that's what he got, no one had ever gotten one of those. And after Bonaventure, no one ever got one again. (laughs) However, he solved the problem. He was a scholastic theologian. They always solve problems. Tom Aquinas can do it too, but he's a little smarter. But that's Dominican. That's Dominican. (laughs) Okay. Believe it or not, forests, freaking forests of trees have given their all to make paper and petroleum byproducts to make ink for the number of articles that have been published on Giles Tonsher. (laughs) Don't you love research scholarship? (laughs) Well, I did not set out to solve the problem of Giles Tonsher, but do you know, remember the story I just told you? You were very good. You notice a problem with that story? Uh, the three quotes don't fit. 
Uh, this story, by, as I told it, by the way, has a, good, has a very good pedigree. It comes in Chilano 1, two years after Francis's death. And there are other problems with the story, too. Where did I say Francis heard the gospel being read? San Damiano. Uh, it is absolutely certain he didn't live at San Damiano until a- live there until after he had followers. So this order is reversed. We could go on. Uh, has anyone here ever read or heard the life of St. Anthony of the Desert? Did that story I just told you about church sound familiar? It sounds like someone just borrowed the life of St. Anthony and fixed it up a little bit. That makes people nervous. Uh, twelve, twelve, a leader and twelve apostles go to Rome. That makes people nervous. But this story is told in every biography I've ever seen of Francis. Now, I'm going to tell you another story. This comes from Anonymous of Perugia. This story of Francis in church hearing the gospel is not in AP. But this story is going to sound sort of familiar. Francis is not living at San Damiano. He's living in the woods. And suddenly, out of nowhere, there arrives his follower, Bernard of Quintavalle, his friend from party days. That's okay. They were friends. Within a day or two, this Peter guy shows up, and Francis is now confused and disturbed. Uh, In short, who ordered him? And Francis is bothered by this. He has no plan. He's being a hermit in the woods. That's all he's doing. Well, Francis says to his two followers now, Bernard and to uh, and Peter, he says, let's go into town. Let's go to the church of St. Nicholas. This used to always cause people problems because everyone assumed that Francis' family home is the one everyone goes to in Assisi today. How many people have been to Assisi? Great. Keep your hands up if you went to Francis's house. Good. Some of you have. It's called, it's, the church is called the Chiesa Nuova. And you can see the supposed door of the cell where he was imprisoned. And the chains are down inside. It's a cross-shaped church. Why is that church there? That church is there because in the 1300s, the Franciscans decided they wanted to have a shrine to Francis's family home. And so they rooted... But people had forgotten over 100 years where his house was. So they went to the archives of the city to try and find it, and sure enough, they found a land conveyance when the house was sold by Francis's grand, grand nephew Angelo in 1280. And it described where the house was. It said it was on the construction zone side of the piazza. Well, they asked around, and they that seemed it was the downhill side of the piazza was the construction zone. So they identified by triangulation this place, and that's where they built the house. Nine year, now, in the 1950s, a, the mayor of Assisi, who wrote a gigantic four-volume history, Life of Francis, that's really just a collection of stuff he found, it's not really a biography, incredibly important, Fortini is his name, he suggested that this was not the right place, that it should have been, that the, he thought the construction zone, the way it's described, should have been on the uphill side of the piazza. I love this. I can eat it with a spoon. Eight years ago, there was drainage problems in the Assisi Piazza. They had to do excavations. They discovered the construction zone. It's on the uphill side. We now know where Francis's house was. Let me draw you a map. Here's the road coming into the piazza. Francis's house would have been here. And right next to it is the Church of St. Paul, which is a little chapel. And on this side, guess what was right here, right next door to his house? St. Nicholas Church. This is starting to sound like a good story. Francis says, let's go to the parish church. And now we know why they went there. By the way, if you go there today, where his house really is, there's no sign to tell you it's there. It's a religious goods store. That's all there is. I was absolutely astounded when I got there. I think some Franciscans are concerned that people not be confused. Okay, what do they do when they get to the Church of St. Nicholas? They get the parish priest and they tell him, we want to do Bible divination. 
Has anyone here ever done Bible divination? You've done it? How did you, how did you do it? Yeah, you pray over it, you open it, you stick your finger in. Dominic did this. It was very common in the Middle Ages. It was viewed as a little bit superstitious, though. Okay? So, what does the parish priest do? He gets the altar missal, which had all the readings in it because he didn't have a full, bi- a full Bible. That was really expensive. They take it into the Church of St. Nicholas, put it on the altar, and pray over it. And they flip it open. The finger goes in. Give up all things and follow me. They close it. They open it. They flip it. The hand goes in. Take neither traveling bag nor staff nor money in your belt. The third time, the finger goes in. Take up your cross daily. Now, this is even better. How many people have been to Baltimore, Maryland? I went to college there. Ever been to the Walther's Art Gallery? Next time you go, go. The altar missile from St. Nicholas Church is in the Walther's Art Gallery in Baltimore. It was discovered there in 1948. They knew they had an old missile, but no one realized it was the one from Francis's parish church at that date, and they only had one. They didn't have a whole bunch, but they were expensive. Well, this story sounding really good, doesn't it? Have you noticed, though, this... Oh, and then Francis and his three followers. Now Francis is even more confused. Give up everything. Traveling Wagner staff, cross daily. They want, well, I probably he wanted to know whether he should have followers or not. In fact, his deathbed testament sounds very much like that. I can do this one from memory. He says, first, when I was in my sins, I found the pr- image, I found the sight of lepers loathsome. But God took me among them and showed me mercy through them, and he made what was bitter sweet. I didn't wait long to leave the world, period. Then God sent me followers, period. It sounds just like the story I've told you. Out of nowhere comes followers. No place. And Francis is confused. Notice Francis is human. He's reacting to situations. Uh, He hasn't got a magic communication from God. He's struggling. And his three followers then go to Rome. Now, I look at this and I can... Does this story sound familiar from Chilano? They sound, they're the same story, aren't they? One's been cleaned up and tidied up and made pious. The other is France, and Francis is in control. The other one, Francis, is struggling and searching. Now, the smoking gun. I love this. You know, when you're, when you're a detective, you always want to find the smoking gun. Shalano one has the mass in church. Anonymous of Perugia has the Bible divination. Legend of the Three Companion, com, Legend of the Three Companions, which I said is a literary composite forgery, has both stories. They just use whatever they've got. Chilano will rewrite his biography. He did not use both stories. He knows them. One's his own, and the other one he knows because he knows Anonymous of Perugia. He uses it. Which of the two stories do you think he keeps? I don't want to volunteer. Which one? The, uh, the one where he goes to Mass at San Domingo except the it, Roman church. No, no, she thinks he keeps his, his story, right? How many people think Chilana's going to keep his own story? Ha, ha, ha. He drops his own story and keeps Anonymous of Perugia's story. Why would he do that? First, it's an indication that they're, they're really the same story. But why would he throw out his and keep the other one? Yes. Yeah, he, he, now people know the true story. His doctored up, cleaned up one. Well, now comes the fun part. How many people... Now let's believe that the story of Anonymous of Peru... That the Anonymous of Perugia story is the true story. How many, how many Franciscans... How, how, many, how many went with Francis to Rome? This is easy. Well, there's three. There's Francis and his two followers. Okay? Now, Brother Giles is Francis's third follower. Did Giles go to Rome? Why not? He's not one or two. It's simple math. Isn't this wonderful? 
Now, I would have been nervous about, because trying to line up all the apostles and things, you know, like the lists in the Gospels, but in the Assisi compilation, there's a description of Brother Giles. Conversion. And here it goes. This is the second smoking gun. It says, Brother Giles, Francis's third follower, had his conversion and joined Francis at Rivo Tordo. Those who have been to Assisi, I hope you all went to Rivo Tordo too. And Tordo too. It's now, Rivo Tordo is a shed. There's now a giant church built around it. Down on the plain. And it's where Francis and his, his followers, how many you want, lived after they got back from Rome. I looked at this and said, why hasn't anyone noticed this? This is the solution to the tonsure problem. He could be a lay brother because he never got tonsured because he never went to Rome. Isn't that beautiful? Now, that's not the important part. The important part is Francis's trip to Rome and what leads up to it now looks very different. Francis is not on a mission from God. He doesn't have 12 apostles. In fact, he's, he's searching to find what God's will for him is. He uses things typical of his age, Bible divination. He's then troubled. He doesn't... You know what? He's a saint I can believe in. Now I'll tell you one more story. Uh, this story is about two stories. My point in retelling this story is that Francis turns out to be a much more complex, sometimes internally conflicted man who's struggling to find what God wants and constantly encountering new things. He's not in control. What he has is great faith in God, but he's not always sure even what God wants of him. He's human. What was it was said down here? What's the big thing in the stories of Francis? Starts with a P. Poverty. I was working on the later part of Francis's life, and there's a fairly famous story. It appears in The Little Flowers. Those who've read The Little Flowers may recognize it. We, we can date it. Francis, after going to Egypt, trying to convert the sultan, which he failed at, comes home and wants out. He doesn't want to be in charge. He is a very bad administrator. He's a great poet. He's a genius of spirituality. He is not a lawyer. Nor is he an administrator. And in order to retire, he's also now very sick. Very, very sick. Uh, he has to compile a final version of his rule and then appoint someone to replace him. He has temporarily appointed Peter of Catani, who was a lawyer before he entered the order, a church lawyer. So and I, you need to know this for the background of the story. And since Peter of Catani became his vicar, his substitute, in the fall of 1220 and then died on the 4th of March 1221, it's a very small window, very small window for the story. Here's the story. Francis is at the Portsioncolo. That's, if you've been to Assisi, the little church inside the gigantic church, that was out, which was Francis's favorite place. Not the giant church, the little church. Actually, a piece of wall of it, about this high and about that long near the ground, on the right side of it goes back to Francis. The rest has been reconstructed many times. But it's still the same shape. And Francis is walking along and a novice. This is a young man who is just going to join the Franciscan order. He hasn't made his vows yet. He's on his year of probation. Comes to Francis and says, Brother Francis, can I have a Psalter, a book of Psalms? Francis in the story says, no, you can't have a Psalter. You can't have that. No, 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 no. That would be a violation of holy poverty. Back comes the next day. The novice is back again. And he says, oh, Francis, you know, really, please, can I have a psalter? Please, 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 please. And Francis says, no, that would be a horrible violation of lady poverty and our holy rule, which we have sworn that we will keep all of our lives sacrosanct and pure. No, 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 you cannot have a psalter. The next day, the novice is back. Uh, Brother Francis, uh, you know, we talked about meeting the Psalter. Maybe you change your mind. And Francis says, go talk to my vicar. <laughs> so the novice goes to the vicar, Peter Catani, who is a university-trained type. He's a canon lawyer, church lawyer. And guess what he says? Yeah, 
yeah, here, here's the Psalter. So the novice is trotting along with the Psalter. Francis sees the novice with the Psalter. Francis goes ape crap. He throws himself on the ground. He throws dirt on his head. He starts, I'm not, this is the way the story, I'm not, I'm not embroidering now. And he begins to cry. And he says, oh God, forgive me. Oh God, will I ever be forgiven? I have allowed you to violate holy poverty. You now have a psalter. The rule is in tatters. Oh God, please forgive me. You now have a psalter. You will soon want a breviary. <laughs> you all know what that is. That's a priest prayer book. And then, and then, then you'll sit on a big chair and you will say to the other brothers, bring me my breviary. <laughs> oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me. Well, my theory is every story about Francis has to be evaluated individually. For a hundred years, the whole thing was to try and find the perfect magic document that just because something was in the document, it had to be true because it was an eyewitness. Since all these stories are all, all these are composites, Stories have to be evaluated individually. I looked at the story and I said, nope, this goes in the circular file. <laughs> Why? Uh, those who have been to Assisi, how many of you have been to the Church of Santa Chiara? Uh, did you notice one of the relics that's down there of St. Francis along with his giant alb? It's his bravery. <laughs> Francis had a bravery. The story makes no sense. It's a weirdo, sto- oh, it's a weirdo poverty story. And I say, nope, can't use this one. Somebody has doctored up this. What was the story about? I've got the vaguest idea. But it can't be about what it seems to be about because Francis himself had a breviary. Now you've got a Psalter, so you want a breviary. I don't. So I put this over with can't use it. In the date, in the time the story is being told, Francis is extremely busy. He is right, trying to rewrite his rule for papal approbation. He is not a lawyer, he is not a bureaucrat, and he's having a horrible time. He produced in 1221 a rather long rule, which is a medley of sermon notes, spiritual conferences, uh, ad hoc legislation. It was such a grab bag that the Pope couldn't, couldn't approve it. It had to be rewritten. And I'm studying it to see what was Francis doing when he was trying to do this, and there it is, chapter 3. Francis hates giving orders. Because for Francis, the most important thing is to put yourself in the lowest place. It was originally suggested that the Franciscan order should be called the Poor Brothers, the Fratres Pauperes. And he said, no, I want them to be called the Lesser Brothers, the Fratres Minores, the Friars Minor. Always take the lowest place. Francis, when he has to give an order, needs to rev himself up. Because he hates doing it. And suddenly, Francis is revving. Uh, I'm not making this up. I solemnly command under holy obedience, as God is my witness, according to the sacred rule, that he's revved up. Illiterate lay brothers may not have psalters. They are to be satisfied reciting our fathers. However, literate lay brothers and clerics may have psalters. And suddenly, I said, I know what the story's about. The story's not about poverty at all. The illiterate lay brother comes to Francis and says, I want a Psalter. Why would an illiterate person in the Middle Ages want a Psalter? Nope. Oh, that's great, they're valuable, but you're thinking in terms of poverty. What is the what, it's the Book of Psalms in Latin. Yeah. Yes! That's how you learn to read. The normal way to learn to read in the Middle Ages, first you learn to read Latin before you learn your vernacular language. The easiest thing is the Psalms. You will learn to read and write simple Latin out by the Psalter. This is an illiterate novice wants a Psalter. What will he do with the Psalter? It's the book of Psalms. Yeah. He'll learn to read. Now, when you learn to read, what do you do? You become a cleric. You'll no longer be a lay brother. You'll move up. Now, now what's going to happen? Francis says, you'll want a breviary. Who, who reads breviaries? Priests. Priest. He'll get ordained. And then he will sit on a big chair and say to the other brothers, hey, you lay brothers there, bring me my breviary so father, father me can read it. It's all about status climbing. And suddenly I go, the story is true. Not in the form in which it's received. 
Now the important point is almost all the stories from the Assisi compilation, which is written down in the 1250s and has been the favorite text, even for Franciscans in writing about Francis, it is full of Francis as going crazy about poverty all the time. It's full of stories like this one, throwing himself on the ground. In the 1250s, the Franciscan order is starting to rip itself apart over living poverty. And you know what? When people tell stories about Francis in the 1250s, contemporary issues get put in Francis's mouth. A story that is about Francis condemning status climbing, which now everyone's doing, the strict Franciscans, the lax Franciscans, if you will, everyone's entering the order, learning to read, being ordained, becoming bishops, and even pope. By 1260, we got a Franciscan pope. Everyone's doing the, the status thing. They're all clerics. And what they're arguing about is poverty. Now comes the second thing. I began, as I began to work on this and discount for when the stories were being told, it started to sound like Francis was not that concerned centrally about poverty. Boy, I hope there are no San Franciscans here. I've been told I need a Kevlar vest. <laughs> okay? And now, there's more to it than that. When the poverty thing, where should I go to find out what Francis thinks about poverty? Where would you go on that list? The rule. The writings of Francis, right? Well, if you go to the writings of Francis, what you discover is Francis uses the word poor or poverty a certain number of times in his own writings. I'm going to let you vote. Everyone has to vote. It's required. Okay, how many people think he uses the word poverty or poor or something like that in his own writings over 150 times? All right, over 75 times. One hand went up in the back. Over 50 times, more hands are up. 20 times, now 10 times. All right, uh, how, many people, how many people think less than 10 times? He uses it four times. Now, I'm not saying Francis didn't live poorly, but Francis's concerns in his own writings does not seem to be about poverty. It seems to be the lowest, being like the lepers. And poverty is important because the person who is at the bottom is dependent on everyone. And if you have resources, if you have resources, you're independent and in control. So poverty is there, but it's a very... And it's very easy to turn it into something else. Uh, I'll tell a story on my Franciscan brethren. There has recently been a reform group of the Franciscans. How many know who Benedict Rochelle is? Yeah, I figured you all would. Okay, Benedict Rochelle started a, a attempt to go back to the pure life of Francis. Now, one of the things that Francis is very clear on is you should keep nothing for the morrow. Because if you have supplies for the morrow, you're not dependent on other people. You're independent. So, Benedict Rochelle's group did not have a refrigerator. Uh, because if you kept food, or, rather than giving it away to the poor, you'd have a resource for the next day. Benedict Rochelle recently has been ill, and he was put on a medication that had to be kept refrigerated. Do people know the story? Okay, and so they voted, and they decided that they would get a refrigerator for Benedict Rochelle's medicine. Six members of his community all left over the refrigerator. <sighs> okay. From the very beginning, how to imitate Francis has been hard. I'm really glad I'm a Dominican. <laughs> so, part of my project, along with encountering a Francis who is often onshore, searching, confronting the unexpected, my Francis has a group of concerns that are not the ones of the traditional stories. For example, I think it's very important that he thought altar linen and chalices should be polished. This is just as much Francis as everything else. So now I'm going to stop. I have talked for, uh, oh my, an hour and 15 minutes. Because there are lots of things to talk about with Francis, and I want you to have your chance to ask me what you'd like to hear about or what you think. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Ask your question. The nativity story. Um, She's asking about the nativity. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. No, th- th- I'm sorry because the people in the back need to hear. Okay. Uh, okay. She wants to know. This is the crash. Yes. And more fits in with humility. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, that is a very well documented incident, uh, witnessed by a number of lay people in Grecho. In the year is 1223. Uh, that one, and it's also very beautiful. Francis's favorite day of the year is Christmas, and you know he loved animals. That story is followed by a sa- in the collection that it's in, the earliest collection, a saying of Francis, and Francis says about Christmas, which this is connected to. On Christmas, if I ever meet the emperor, I will have him make a law that all the animals get an extra ration of feed. I want even the houses to enjoy Christmas. I would like it if you took grease and rubbed it on the outside of the house so they could have Christmas dinner too. <laughs> but yeah, the, the Gresho incident, and it is the first example of putting together uh, images. We don't know if they were statues or paintings around the with the animals. And Francis, at that time, he, he served as deacon at that midnight mass and preached. And those who were there said that they, when he would talk about the bambino de Bethlehem, it sounded like bah, bah, the sheep. It's a beautiful story. I'll, I'll just repeat it. Okay. That sounds like a contradiction. Okay. Well, here's what I mean by that. Let me give you an example. Uh, 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 the question is, what do I mean when I said something was true fiction? I'm going to take a, an incident that I don't believe is historical. Okay. Uh, I do not believe that the story of Francis, of the Pope see, dreaming about Francis, and then seeing him in Rome when he arrives and immediately recognizing him from the dream, which has Francis holding up the Lateran Basilica, which was the Pope's cathedral. Uh, I think that that's, that, I don't think that's a, that didn't happen. However, the story is true. Why is it true? The point of the story is that the whole church in the Pope will, will recognize that Francis saves the church in a time of crisis and supports it. So the way medieval people get theological or spiritual meaning, since they don't stop and say, oh, and this is what Francis means for us, what they'll do is they'll tell a story. This story, the, the story, the point of the story that Francis has, has, is in accord with the divine mission, the, Pope, the church will recognize that, and that he will hold up the church and support it in hard times. They're all true, but the story is a literary fiction. So, even a, even a even a novel can contain truths. Sometimes novels have many more truths in them than, you know, the kind of stuff that historians write sometimes, which is like collections of page after page of statistics that don't seem to mean much of anything. Does that help a little bit? Okay. Uh, this is why I would say that a legend may not have happened, but it would be true. Okay. Because of the message it's, it's, it's communicating. That the message is true. Yes. But the facts are not. Yeah. Okay. Exactly, yeah. And in medieval saints' life, for one thing, for example, all uh, it's the job of medieval saints to work miracles. By the way, I think modern saints should work miracles too. But when you're writing a story, you want to, to glorify the saint and show that they're an agent of God and have great power. You know, so, well, all saints are like that, so you can borrow a miracle story from somebody else to make a point on it. If it did, my favorite, do you know what this is like? Have you read... The History of the English-Speaking Peoples by Winston Churchill. And he, okay, multi-volume. And he tells all the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And he closes that section by saying, and that's how it was. <laughs> or, that's how it should have been. And more and better besides if the full truth were known. That's the spirit of Saints Life writing. There was a, yes. Uh, 
This is not meant to be funny. The church is always in crisis. Read the letters of St. Paul. There was never a golden age when we were all saints. Okay. Um, at the time of Francis, Europe is undergoing enormous economic change. One of the things that's made Francis popular is they see him as rejecting early capitalism. That's why he gets turned into a Marxist. Okay. Uh, what Francis is in one way the most conventional of Italian laymen. I wrote a huge book on religious life of Italian laymen. But, and Francis fits that and he addresses the issues of those people. Reverence for the sacraments by clergy who are sloppy, for example. And the poverty thing is true. Uh, people who are careerist. There's also uh, l- preaching of dissent going on. The Cathars who believed in two gods and rejected the sacraments. There are a lot of... And Francis, uh, Francis is... Ex- in my, I'll speak theologically. He is so much what people are longing for. He is, he is the perfect saint for his age. And you know what? That's what made him so incredible. In 1215, as best we can tell, his appro- first approval with the Pope, the three of them go to Rome, is in 1209. Probably in 1215, he had no more than 200 followers, and they were all just around Assisi. By the time he leaves for Egypt in 1218, there are Franciscans in all parts of Europe, and there are probably as many as 8,000 of them. That's in two years. Most of them will never have met him. But his vision is one that excites everybody. So, uh, yeah, the church is always in crisis, and he was the man, the man of his hour. But he was not a good administrator. <laughs> Dominic was. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you asked. Those who have seen Brother, Son, Sister, Moon and read a lot of things about Francis will know that uh, he has uh, the founder of the Franciscan women whom he knows. Uh, There are a number of historians, mostly Franciscans, who are interested in feminist issues and therefore attention on Claire as the feminine face of the Franciscan movement has been intense. Uh, Bertoli now available in English, has written what is now the best biography of Claire. Those of you who are interested. Uh, The embarrassing thing is that as far as we can tell, Francis's contact with Claire was very little. Uh, She comes to him in the winter of 1212, and it is set up by her her cousin, who is a Franciscan brother, uh, his name is Rufino, and Francis and she talk. Francis has become known around the city. He's a local holy man living his hermit life in the woods, really. They haven't even really started preaching yet. And agreement is made, by the way, with Bishop Guido colluding in it, that on Palm Sunday, Bishop Guido will signal to her to escape from her house by giving her her palm individually. Uh, All Easter ceremonies in Italian cities were done at the cathedral. The parish was all shut down. Everyone went to the cathedral for Easter week. And there were hundreds of babies baptized at the Easter vigil. Well, on Palm Sunday, the men line up and the women line up and they get their palms from the bishop. He then gets, Bishop Guido walks down the nave and gives it to her individually. That night, she and her serving lady break out of the house. They go to where Francis is living at that time. They're now at the Porziuncola. Francis cuts her hair off, and before morning he has deposited her in a Benedictine monastery. Uh, The Benedictines don't want her there because suddenly her sister arrives and wants to join her. So Francis has to go and move her again. He moves her to Ponzo to another Benedictine house. Uh, Three more women come and want to join her, and finally Francis is told she can't live here. They don't want to be Benedictines. Francis then goes to to the bishop and says, is there any place? And he says, yes, I'll give them San Damiano as a convent. Francis takes them to San Damiano, and as far as we can tell, they will never meet again until Francis is dying. They did have, apparently, letters exchanged. Claire mentions Francis in general many times in her six letters. Only once does she quote a letter from him. She says to Agnes of Prague, our, our Holy Father Francis wrote to me that 
uh, sisters who have bad health should not have to fast as much as other one as those in good health. This is such a commonplace. Is this the best she can get? A, even the ones who want there to be a strong relationship between the two of them, the general consensus is that there was very little contact. However, when Francis was dying, the nuns at San Damiano took care of him. But then he was brought, he had died at San, at, at, he then will die at the Porciuncola. The funeral will go and they'll pull down the grill so that they can kiss the body. Francis, however, did have female friends. My, the one that I'd love to know more about is Jacoba Settisole. She was a lay penitent. She was a widow who lived in Rome. Whenever Francis went to Rome, she took care of Francis. She made him marzipan, and he loved it. When Francis was dying, who was on his mind? Not Claire. Uh, what he says is, he says to one of the brothers, oh, you have to send a messenger to Rome. He's in Assisi. That's about a three-day trip. To let Brother Jacoba. Oh, whenever she'd come to a Franciscan house, you know they have cloister and women can't come in. He would say, no, she can come in because she's Brother Jacoba. <laughs> Send to Brother Jacoba that I need, will, that I'm dying and I need the, 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 the gray smock she's making for my funeral and can she please send me some of her marzipan. <laughs> and when the messenger goes out the door, guess who is already arriving in town? Jacoba. And she also brought candles for his funeral. That's the relationship I'd love to know about. But she was considered probably about 30 years older than he was. Yeah. Pig's leg? Yeah, that story first appears in the Latin version of what will become the Fioretti. That story is 130 years after Francis. And, uh, you know, I really hope there was a brother Juniper because he's a nifty guy. Uh, he, there's no Juniper li- r- mentioned in the early records. One of the historical practices that, w- that a good historian does is they never read b- documents backwards. You start with the oldest documents and don't read backwards because it's very easy to retroject later things earlier. Uh, that story about the... Does everyone... Uh, I'll tell the story forever. Francis is sick, and it's juniper, and Francis says, you know, I think I might be able to eat a pork chop. So juniper goes out, and what does juniper do? He goes down the road, and there is a pig running around in a field. Juniper pulls out his hatchet, hacks off one of the pig's three legs. The three-legged pig continues running. Francis, he brings the pork chop. Well, very soon, uh, here comes the farmer is really upset. Francis says, see, the brother Juniper is so simple. He just wants to be charitable. And the farmer is so overwhelmed with the wonderful holiness of Juniper that he gives the friars the whole pig. Yeah, it's a pretty weird story, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, I, uh, there's a, a, I, I have not worked very much on the little flowers because they're so late. Uh, there's pl- a huge literature on this. Uh, there's, I am inclined to think that a great deal of Brother Juniper are exempla, that they're stories that you would tell in a sermon to illustrate something. I don't think they're necessarily historical. Uh, there's a debate over whether Juniper is a literary creation himself, but I think he's real. Yes. Uh, yes, in fact, Father Vincent promised that he would photocopy more copies. Uh, so uh, you'll make them available, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Any, uh, what about Francis and Dominic? Did they meet in Rome? <laughs> it is possible that they met. Okay. However, the the the. Uh, the, the story which, of the meeting, which first appears in the Assisi compilation, probably written down in the 1250s, is a very suspicious story. I will tell you the story in a moment, and you'll see why it's a suspicious story. But first let's ask, why would people think that the two of them met? Well, that's what people usually say. They've seen the pictures. 
Uh, the, okay, here's here is one. Here's there is in the oldest strata. There is indications that St. Dominic was present at the General Assembly. It's called uh, the chapter of the Franciscan Order on w one year on Pentecost, Pentecost week in Francis's lifetime. All the Franciscans, in theory, in the world got together uh, in Assisi for a big meeting. And, so, and the story is Francis, D Dominic was at one of those uh, chapters. If that's true, you'd think they'd meet, right? Uh, D Vicaire, uh, who is a Dominican historian, wrote the definitive historical study of Dominic, and what he, he is able to locate where Dominic was at Pentecost for every year of Francis's life except one. And he is never anywhere near Assisi at, that to, uh, at Pentecost, except in the year 1218. So if he was there, he was there in 1218. I think he probably was, because we also know that Cistercians had been inv invited in 1218 to help work on the Franciscan uh, rule, which was still in flux, and Francis is not a good lawyer. Here's the problem. In 1218, Francis is in Egypt. I, so I think the people knew Dominic was in Assisi. They assumed, oh, he must have met Francis when he was in Assisi for that chapter. Then someone goes, wait a minute, that chapter was when Francis was away. But the story that they had met takes on a life of its own. Well, and when, when would they have met? Oh, they must have met at Cardinal Ugolino's house because Cardinal Ugolino was a patron of both Francis and Dominic. So if you think they met, that's a logical place for them to meet. Now, I will tell you the earliest version of the story. It's set in Ugolino's house. It's in Rome. U Cardinal Ugolino, who will later be the Pope who canonizes Francis, is throwing a banquet. And Dominic is there, and Francis is there, and they're having all sorts of nice munchies and food. And Francis sneaks out the back door, and he goes around begging up beggar food in the street. Poverty story. You know my feeling about those. He then comes in and sits on the floor eating the beggar food, and all of the ecclesiastics, the cardinals and the cardinal and the bishops, are totally humiliated and embarrassed. If there's anything Francis doesn't do, he does not embarrass. He kisses the feet of clergy. Uh, th that doesn't fit either. What does Ugolino do? He says, "Oh, Brother Francis, you are so wonderful. You're so holy. Can we have some of your beggar food?" So Francis goes around and gives them each a piece of the beggar food, which they wrap in their napkin and take away as a relic. Dominic then comes to Francis and says, Oh, Brother Francis, you're so, you're so holy and so wonderful, and your order has the true inspiration. Let's merge our orders, and you will be in charge. Francis says to Dominic, Oh, Brother Dominic, that will never work. Your order was founded to preach true doctrine. My order was founded to be perfect like Jesus. <laughs> Put yourself in the lowest place, right? Uh, all versions of the meeting of Francis are in one form or another rewrites of that story. They may have met, but the evidence for it is not so good. Yes? Uh, uh, what, what happened was that uh, throughout the project, which t took me three years, uh, throughout it, especially for the first two years, every month I was having an aha moment where I'd see something I'd go, oh my goodness, I've now realized what, how Brother Giles could be both tonsured and not tonsured, he wasn't tonsured. I'd go through a whole bunch of these, it was all, but what was happening is every time one of these aha moments happened. Uh, like, for example, the second one I told you, where suddenly I realized the story's true, but it's not what it's set up to be about. It's really about something else. Francis became more complex, more interesting, and even more internally conflicted. Uh, he, became an ama he became a living human being of enormous complexity. He's not the plaster guy on the birdbath. <laughs> uh, it was uh, he, it, and probably of all medieval saints, he's the one where we can reconstruct his interior life to the greatest amount, uh, it, because we have so much writing about him, and then his own writings to control them with. Yes. I understand one time I heard something, and, uh, it's in 
Baptist was preaching to the townspeople so much about God's love that they actually said, told him, go away, go away, just get away from us. We know all that stuff, so we have to talk to the animals just to get it out of the system. Uh, okay, let's do the sermon to the birds. Did you have a question? Yeah, I can wait. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I've never heard that version, but uh, the originally the sermon to the birds. Uh, first, Francis not only loved animals; animals loved Francis. The earliest, most primitive versions of Francis' animal stories are very interesting. All medieval saints have power over animals in their saint's life because they're supposed to be like the Garden of Eden where Adam can control the animals. So it is a hagiographic, it is a saint's life stereotype that saints have power over angel, over animals. Francis, is in the earliest stories, are not presented that way. Rather, Francis spontaneously delights in God when he's encountering animals and he doesn't control them. Now, there are four versions of the preaching to the birds. The oldest one is in Chilano 1, and it goes like this. Francis is walking down the road near Bavania, Italy, and there is a giant flock of birds out in the field. Oh, he loved animals. His favorite animal was the bird, and his favorite bird was the lark. Okay. Now, he sees these birds, and so he walks over because he loves birds, and he walks over, and the birds don't fly away. They're all, he can walk into the middle of the birds. By the way, I don't consider this much of a miracle. Has anyone here ever been to Piazza San Marco with the pigeons? <laughs> you know, sometimes birds fly away, sometimes they don't. Uh, but what does Francis do? Francis is moved to love the birds and to praise God for them. And he says, oh, you birds, you can fly so high. You're always with God. You neither toil nor spend. Oh, you birds, give glory to God, and the birds all fly up in the air, praising God. And then it shows that there's a problem with the story. Do you know what Chilano then says? He says, see, he has power over animals. The story doesn't say anything of the sort. It's a beautiful story. It's about Francis encountering nature, and the birds aren't afraid of him, and he rejoices in God. Now, here's the next version. The next version of the story, which is found in the legend of the three companions, Francis is, sees a bunch of birds out in the field after he's left a city where it's something like your story where it's, he hasn't had some great preaching or something. And he goes and he says to the birds, birds, hear the word of the Lord. And the birds stop. He walks over. He preaches the whole sermon again to the birds. And the birds nod their heads as much as they can. Maybe they were pigeons. Okay. And then Francis says, now praise God. And the birds all fly up in the air and form a cross. Now you notice it's the same story, but it's changed. Here's the third version of the story. Francis is preaching, and people are not paying attention. And there's a bunch of birds sitting in a tree. And Francis turns to the people and he says, and this is supposed to be taking place in Spello. He says, so the story moves around. You people, you don't listen to the word of the Lord. Those birds will listen to the word of the Lord. Birds, come down. Birds all come down. All right, you birds. And he preaches to the birds, and he, and he says, and now... Notice how quiet those birds are. And people have been walking, he says, and those birds are not going to leave. I order you birds. You are not going to leave till I give you my blessing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, birds, now you can leave. <laughs> the fourth version. You see what's happening here? To, okay, the fourth version, it's actually the birds are a bunch of vultures and buzzards and stuff like that. And... He, uh, it's even more dramatized that Francis controls the buzzards and all this and then you know the townspeople are all humiliated because the birds listen and, uh, this is the kind of thing well on one level yeah animals are more attentive to God than we are uh, some of the time and shouldn't saints be like the Garden of Eden where and you know don't people need their comeuppance from a tough sermon once in a while even if they have to listen to it being preached to birds so on one level it's true but the story has been reworked the authentic Francis stories, uh, he, are always Francis delighting in animals, and they're very, and they're they're almost unique. Uh, I, I, he was one of those people where there's some people, where you know even the cat that scratches everybody will go up and rub on that person. You know there are people that animals just seem to like, and this seems to be Francis. This and of course for the medieval that shows he has power over animals. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, there used to be an attempt to reconstruct how many rules there were uh, based on stories from the 1250s when there's this big fight over poverty there are a bunch of stories about uh, the ministers destroying a rule the only rules that we can really identify as having existed okay, is the collection of scripture things that they take to Rome from the Bible divination, to which other things seems to have been added. Then there is his attempt to put it all together in 1221, which is so confusing, uh, but very Francis. And that, then there is a much shorter version of that, which has undergone revision, clearly with the help of someone who was a canon lawyer, probably Peter of Catani, maybe Cardinal Ugolino, and that's the rule, it's about six pages long. That one is the one that goes, and the Pope approves it in 1226. After which, for the first time, Francis in his own writings calls his movement an order. Before that, he always calls it the comfort of the fraternity, the brotherhood, or he calls it my form of life. Okay. Uh, so, and Francis never spoke of the other, uh, these other rules. He, when he said my rule, he meant the 1223 one. Interestingly, there's uh, an image that the 1223 rule is watered down on poverty. It's just the opposite. Uh, in the rule that Francis himself wrote, he says, friars can never have money. Uh, unless there are sick friars, and maybe, maybe they could also have some money for, uh, for, for lepers. Fri friars should never keep anything till the next day. Oh, uh, well, unless there are sick friars around or there are lepers. This is not how you legislate. In the second rule, it's made absolute. The exceptions are gone. And the role of the superior is given a little bit of discretion that he doesn't have before. Uh, Francis got, and Francis never complained about the second rule. He always calls it his rule. So which one is the solution? Today, the 1223, the, it's called the, the regula bulata, the rule with a bull, which is a papal stamp. It was the one that the Pope, that was actually Pope Honorius III approved for him. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Francis's, uh, the early biographies, even up to Chilano II, have virtually no life miracles while he's alive. Uh, the kind they have uh, are, for example, Francis is called in to pray over someone who is sick and the person gets better. Uh, Francis is going down the road, uh, he's sick, and somebody is sent to him that he should come and pray over a woman who's having trouble in labor. Francis doesn't go. So the guy comes and steals the horse's bridle that night, takes it back, wraps it around his wife, and she gives birth with no trouble, and he keeps the bridle to have, so other women can have easy deliveries. The, it's, those are the, kind of, the life miracles, and there are not many. There are like five or six of them are all this kind of healing thing. Uh, after Francis's death, at the funeral, there is a woman, a young woman whose head is sort of, her ne she has kind of thing with her neck where her head is forced down on her shoulder, and she touches the tomb and her neck straightens up, although she remains to having a pit on her shoulder where her head was pushed down. And from then on, it's like one healing miracle after another at the tomb. Uh, perhaps the greatest miracle during his lifetime, of course, is the miracle of the stigmata. Uh, the appearance of the signs of the uh, nails in the hands and feet. And that is very interesting. The usual version, what you would expect, is that it was holes. The oldest version of this, including an eyewitness thing by 25 citizens after his death was, it was not, in his hands and feet it was not a hole. It was a fleshy black protrudence that looked like the top of a nail. And on the front, bottom of his hand, it was what looked like a bent over nail. Now that is so weirdo, you, no one would have made it up that way. Uh, so even atheists and people who don't like religion, the consensus is this is such a weird thing, however you want to explain it, that uh, it's got to be true because you wouldn't have made it up that way if you're going to fake it. You do, you do holes. Uh, so I would say that's an important one. But most of Francis's miracles, like most saints, are done when they get to heaven and die. Yeah. 
it's very difficult. Uh, the uh, we can, from the symptoms, it seems he had either extremely bad ulcers or cancer of the stomach. He was coughing up blood. Uh, he was extremely weakened uh, overall uh, and couldn't eat. He probably had malaria. The most painful part of this, though, he had some kind of an eye infection that made... Oh, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, the, he had some kind of an eye infection that caused his eyes to be extraordinarily sensitive to light. So much so that they took his cowl up and sewed cloth over it so that he could, and he, kept, he would stay in dark places. When this was at its worst, he wrote his great poem, The Canticle of the Sun. Do you know this? Blessed be you, Lord, for brother sun who gives us light, and for sister moon who rules the night. It's one of the great poems of the Italian language. Almost everything mentioned in it involves light. The very thing that's causing him pain at that time. It's a very interesting coincidence. Sun and fire and light and stars, everything in it is light, and that's what causes him to be in agony when he writes it. Very interesting. Uh, we're now approaching almost two hours, so and I can see some people are some people need to go to bed, including me. Uh, I'm willing to chat informally up here, but I think we should now end. And let's. Uh, Francis is famous for the first one to use uh, the phrase uh, Mary, the, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. He had a great Marian devotion. So let us invoke Our Lady's uh, uh, aid. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Francis of Assisi. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.